In this video series, I want to challenge what you think you know about the real numbers. It's pretty easy to take them for granted, since many of us learn about them in an intuitive manner, along with this geometric picture of the real number line. But I want to try and convince you that the real numbers aren't as, well, real as you might think they are, but rather they're an extremely useful fiction. Moreover, I hope that by breaking down your conception of the real numbers in this way, it'll make it easier to build up their formal definition using the idea of something called Cauchy sequences. And I think that doing it in this way will make it easier to digest other abstract objects, such as the piatic numbers whose strange nature we will explore in future videos. Perhaps a good place to start is to ask yourself, what is the definition of a real number? Maybe you think of them as infinite strings of digits, or you think of them as rational numbers together with non- or irrational numbers. Describing the rational numbers isn't too difficult. Technically, to be precise, we need to talk about equivalence classes, but for now we'll stick with our intuitive notion of rational numbers as ratios of whole numbers. But now I ask, how do you define an irrational number? Many people first learn that it's just a number which isn't rational, but then what is just a number? Certainly an elephant isn't a rational number, but there probably isn't a sensible interpretation under which we could consider an elephant an irrational number. Instead, we might consider the definition as an infinite sequence of digits going off to the right, and this still isn't really precise, but it's better. At least we've put these objects in a more solid context. Uh, to help us along, let's consider one of the most famous irrational numbers, pi. We know that it's digital expansion because it says 3.14159, and what can we say about this? Well, since in the real world we're only ever approximating things by uh, rational numbers up to some finite number of decimal places, we might consider some sort of rational approximations of pi. Uh, for instance, just this list of the digits. So perhaps we could formally construct the real numbers from the rational numbers by considering sequences of rational numbers. However, we're going to need to impose some further restrictions in order to capture our intuitive notion of the real numbers. For example, this sequence appears to be tending off towards infinity, which isn't a real number given our intuitive understanding of it. Or consider this sequence. It seems to jump around pretty wildly, so we're going to need to be strict enough to rule out these seemingly wild things. But keep in mind that we want to recapture all of those things we think we can already do with the real numbers. Uh, for instance, in calculus, there's all of these sorts of strangely defined sequences and series that should somehow converge to a real number. Uh, so even a pattern like this one here, it wiggles around a little bit, but it does seem to be tending towards something. So what do all the nice sequences have in common that would rule out the sequences we don't want? Let's do some playing around, because after all, that's how mathematical discoveries actually get made. As we've seen, these good sequences seem to tend towards something, but the issue is that with the sequence seen here, we can't say that it converges to pi because we're still trying to pin down the definition of irrational numbers. Is there some way that we can capture that idea just with the rational terms of the sequence itself? To gather more intuition, let's plot some sequences as dots in the plane whose x-coordinate is its position in the sequence and whose y-coordinate is its value. The red dots represent our sequence converging to pi, while the blue dots tend off towards infinity, and the green dots represent the sequence that just jumps around chaotically. I think it's worth pausing the video here to see if you can spot something that the blue and green sequences have in common, which the red sequence doesn't share. There aren't really right or wrong answers here, but there is one particular observation that will guide us on our journey. 
One thing that the bad sequences have in common is that their points get far away from each other, or at least the relative distances don't tend to decrease in general. Meanwhile, if we look at the red sequence, its points get closer and closer to each other, not just some particular point. This is actually a great observation because this is a property intrinsic to the sequence and doesn't refer to some yet to be defined number that it seems to tend towards. So now that we have an idea of what might be the right concept to capture the real numbers, let's try and formalize it. First, we're going to need to start off with an abstractly represented sequence of rational numbers. We want to talk about distances between pairs of numbers, an and am, in the sequence. And in the rational numbers, we can measure differences between points by taking the absolute values of their difference. That is, the distance from an to am is going to be the absolute value of their difference difference, and either one doesn't matter precisely because we're taking an absolute value, so we'll always get a positive number. Now we want to express the idea that the further down the sequence we go, the smaller the distances get, so that their differences tend to zero. Another way to put this is that given any fixed positive distance epsilon greater than zero, where here epsilon is a rational number since we have yet to define real numbers, all pairs of numbers an and am beyond a certain a capital N have the property that their distance is less than epsilon. So for any positive distance, eventually all the terms of the sequence become closer to each other than that distance epsilon. To express this more formally with mathematical symbols, we'll say that we're interested in sequences such that for all epsilon bigger than zero, which are rational numbers representing our distances, there exists some big N, a natural number, so that whenever M and N are bigger than big N, or equal to, it forces the distance between those terms to be less than epsilon. This is the formal definition of what's known as a Cauchy sequence. Now, for those of you who have learned about epsilon delta proofs before, you might recognize that this looks extremely similar to the definition of convergent sequences of real numbers. However, there are several key differences here. Most notably, the definition of convergence presupposes you have some sort of convergent, L, that is well defined in the first place. These definitions are similar for a reason though, and this is something we should expect. If this abstract definition is really capturing our notion of real number, then Cauchy sequences should have something to do with convergent sequences. In fact, if you have a sequence of real numbers that satisfies this definition of convergence, then you can prove that that same sequence satisfies the definition of a Cauchy sequence. That is, all convergent sequences are Cauchy sequences. Which is great! It's a hint that we're on the right track. I won't go through the proof in this video, but it's a great exercise if you've worked with these sorts of proofs before. I want to take a second to make an important side note here. The definition of convergent sequence that you might be used to still makes sense in the rational numbers if we impose the extra conditions that epsilon and L are rational. This will be important in a moment. However, this means that if we're simply restricting ourselves to rational world, some sequences might not converge anymore. For example, our sequence of focus has no rational number L for which this definition is satisfied, since we already know it's going to converge to an irrational number pi. Okay, back to our main quest. It's tempting to think that we're essentially done. We realize that real numbers can all be represented by sequences of rational numbers, and that the terms of those sequences should get successfully closer to each other. So we should just define the real numbers to be the set of all Cauchy sequences, right? Well, there's an issue here. Consider the constant sequence 1, 1, 1, it's just 1's the whole time. Since every term of this sequence is just 1, the difference between any two terms of this sequence is the absolute value of 1 minus 1, which is 0. 
Therefore, since for any choice of rational number bigger than zero, we find that the distance between any two points in the sequence is less than that rational number, and hence the sequence is Cauchy. To be a little more formal in a proof, we might say something like this. Let epsilon be a positive rational number, and choose n to be the natural number 1. Then, for every pair of natural numbers m and n bigger than big N, we can see that the distance from a n to a m is equal to the absolute value of 1 minus 1, which is the absolute value of 0, which is 0, and that is less than epsilon. Therefore, the sequence defined by uh, a sub n equal to 1 for all little n a natural number is Cauchy. Meanwhile, if you've worked with infinite series before, you've probably come across the fact that 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 8 and continuing to add the inverses of powers of 2 ad infinitum will sum up to 1. We can express this in terms of a sequence by defining Sn to be the nth partial sum. That is, Sn is going to be the sum where we simply stop when we get to 1 over 2 to the power of n. Therefore, the sequence S1, S2, S3 also tends towards 1, and moreover, it is Cauchy as well. So now we have two rational Cauchy sequences, the constant sequence and the partial sum sequence, and both of these represent the number 1, but they're distinct sequences. Since we'll want 1 to equal 1 in the real numbers, we're going to need a way to identify sequences that tend towards the same thing. But again, we can't just say that we'll consider two sequences to be the same if they converge to the same number, because that number might be irrational, and we still haven't defined those yet. So, yet again, we need to search for a way to express this idea that's intrinsic to the terms of the rational sequences themselves. We have an idea about how these real numbers ought to behave. So, skipping ahead again, just to gain some inspiration, let's suppose we had two sequences, a sub n and b sub n, and suppose that they both converge to the same number, potentially real, l. Then, while we have no rigorous proofs yet, we should expect, from our understanding of calculus, that sequences preserve addition. That is, the difference of the limits of the two sequences is the limit of the difference. And since the difference of the limits is just L minus L, well, that's equal to zero, and that means that the limit of the difference is equal to zero. Therefore, the two sequences will converge to the same number if and only if the sequence of differences converges to zero. This is great news, because zero is already a rational number. While we can't talk about the convergent of some arbitrary sequence of rational numbers, because it could, a priori, converge to an irrational number, if you recall my side comment, we can talk about the sequences of rational numbers that converge to rational numbers. It turns out that declaring a n and b n to represent the same number if their differences converge to zero defines an equivalence relation, which we're going to call tilde, on the set of all Cauchy sequences. For the sake of yours and, quite frankly, my attention span, I'm going to save the rigorous proof of this for the next video. But for those of you that are up for a challenge, it would be a great homework exercise to try and prove it for yourself before that next video comes out. So, forgoing the rigor of the coming video, finally we're ready to precisely define the real numbers. First, create the set C of all Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. Then, we define the real numbers to be the quotient of C by the aforementioned equivalence relation. For those of you less familiar with some of these fancy words, all this means is that we're formally treating Cauchy sequences whose differences tend to zero to represent the same thing. And there we have it! Now, there's still a bunch of work to do in order to recover all of the aspects of the real numbers that you know and love. I need to prove to you that this tilde really is an equivalence relation, and if you don't know what that means, you can try some of my videos on set theory.
and I'll need to rigorously define things like addition and multiplication and convince you that this really models your intuitive notion of real number. Before we conclude, I do want to leave you with one final note. It's partly because of this definition that there's so much confusion surrounding the statement 0.999 repeating equals 1. For starters, what does 0.999 repeating even mean? It's not particularly rigorous to say, oh, the nines just go on forever. Since we know that the constant sequence converges to 1, if we look at the sequence of differences, 1 minus 0.9, 1 minus 0.99, and so on, we can see that it converges to zero. Therefore, by definition, they represent the same real number, which we call one. That's what 0.999 repeating equals one really means. In conclusion, the confusion surrounding it stems from the fact that we tell people about this shorthand notation, 0.999 repeating, and some facts about it without explaining its true meaning. In future videos, we will construct collections QP known as the p-adic numbers. On one hand, they behave much weirder than the real numbers, but on the other, they have some nice features such as unique representatives. Uh, that means that there's no potentially confusing statements that are like 0.999 repeating equal to 1. But that the philosophy of mathematical reality, and fun and rigorous proofs will all have to wait for future videos. Thanks for watching.